The following video details some of the most gruesome bear attacks on record. These cases include some of the most notorious polar bear attacks in the history of Svalbard in Norway, the most brutal grizzly bear attack on record when it comes to Montana's Glacier National Park, the case of a man who was attacked by a grizzly bear twice on the same hike, and much more. You're watching When Bears Attack. It's said that every explorer knows the risks associated with their chosen life of adventure. In July of 2010, however, two Norwegian adventurers would come to realize the true nature of those risks as they attempted to make history in the icy realms of the Arctic. This is the horrifying true story of 23-year-old Sebastian Plur Nielsen and his friend Ludwig Field, the former of which would on one fateful day wake up with his head trapped in the jaws of a polar bear. In late July of 2010, kayaker Sebastian Nielsen and his friend Ludwig Field set out on a quest in an attempt to set a world record by becoming the first team to paddle around Norway's Svalbard archipelago. The island chain, which is located midway between mainland Norway and the North Pole, comprises of nine main islands and spans over 24,000 square miles, nearly 60% of which is covered in snow. This icy northern wonderland boasts a surreal dramatic wilderness of ice fields and tundras nestled between mountains and glaciers. Svalbard's breathtaking landscape aside, the extreme nature of the expedition would bring the men to the bounds of their grit, and this was in more ways than just one. For instance, average summer temperatures in the area range between 37 and 44 degrees Fahrenheit, and to circumnavigate the archipelago, the kayakers would need to traverse around 1,250 miles of frigid waters. Nielsen and Field had spent years planning and training for the two-month journey, practicing their paddling in Norway's icy fjords and rivers, as well as testing their endurance by swimming in its freezing waters. It's also worth mentioning that Nielsen and Field were cautioned by other Arctic explorers that they'd encountered during their training about just how dangerous polar bears can be. Heeding these warnings, the pair would go on to undertake rifle training, diligently preparing for every scenario. However, little did they know just how crucial this training was, as not long afterward, they would have to apply the skills they'd learned from it in a life-or-death, real-world situation. With its seven national parks and 29 protected areas, Svalbard is a haven for wildlife, from ox and puffins to seals and reindeer. But as many of you may already know, this icy region also falls within the natural range of the largest and most powerful carnivore on land. The polar bear, aptly dubbed the king of the Arctic, roams these northern islands, like other apex predators, these creatures sit at the very top of the food chain, where humans are their only threat. However, sometimes the tables can turn, and when they do, the results are the vast majority of the time catastrophic. While polar bears primarily hunt seals, they're also known to take down the occasional walrus and even reindeer from time to time, which is a testament to the sheer strength of this impressive animal. They can weigh up to a whopping 1,800 pounds, and while they are more slender and streamlined than brown bears, they have exceptionally large clawed paws and razor-sharp teeth perfectly adapted for cutting into meat and blubber. They also have two layers of fur and a thick layer of fat to insulate them against the freezing Arctic temperatures, making them the ideal pagophilic predator. But there is something else that sets these bears aside from other carnivores and places them amongst the most feared predators on the planet. They're also known as one of the only carnivores on the planet to view humans as food. During their attempt at making history, Nielsen and Field kayaked during the days, averaging about 15 miles per, and would spend their nights camping under the spectacular Norwegian sky. By the end of the month, they'd reached a blistery Nordostlandent, which is one of the northernmost islands in the archipelago. The high winds and rough seas of that particular day would force the pair to retreat to the shore early and set up their camp for the night on a rocky beach. And like every evening, they rigged up an old tripwire perimeter fence roughly 9 feet from their tent, with the purpose of course of scaring off a curious bear, and also alerting them if one was around. They even got a chance to test the tripwire, when Nielsen would accidentally stumble over it while chasing a tarp, after which he would replace the charge, content in the knowledge that the tripwire worked. The next morning, the duo woke up to even stormier weather, which is when they decided to play it safe and hang back at camp for the day. Miles away, a large male polar bear had been using the winds to track any scents blowing his way. The bear would, unfortunately for Nielsen and Field, pick up their scent, which it likely deemed to be a potential food source, prompting its natural instinct to investigate. That evening, Nielsen and Field lay in their two-person tent. They had completed their nightly rifle check and made sure they were locked and loaded as they drifted off to sleep to the sounds of howling winds outside. 
Soon enough, the polar bear would reach the campsite and began investigating the unfamiliar setting. To the misfortune of Nielsen and Field, the bear would then pass through the aforementioned tripwire, but this time, it did not trigger. The bear would then stealthily approach the tent where Nielsen and Field were sound asleep, and with a single swipe of its massive paw, it would easily rip open the tent. A startled Nielsen was then jolted awake and would freeze in horror as he locked eyes with the hungry polar bear. Just as he screamed bear, the polar bear sprang toward him and clamped its jaws around his head. Nielsen could feel the bear's teeth scraping against his skull as it pulled him out of his sleeping bag and proceeded to drag him from the tent. It was then in a desperate bid to save his own life that Nielsen was able to reach out and grab his shotgun in the midst of the chaos, while ineffectively of course punching the mighty bear in the head with his free hand. The bear would at this point suddenly release his skull and grab Nielsen by the shoulder. It would then vault him into the air like a ragdoll, violently thrashing him back and forth, sinking its teeth deeper and deeper into his flesh to maintain a grip with every jerk of its massive head. The bear then proceeded to drag him along the rocky beach toward the water, and just as Nielsen finally snapped into his senses, realizing he was still holding on to the shotgun, the bear then shook him again, causing him to drop the gun, which the mighty bear then stepped on, snapping it in two as if it were a twig. By now, Nielsen had lost all hope, accepting his fate as what he believed to be his only chance of survival lay in pieces on the ground. But Field, who had woken up to Nielsen's scream in a camp in tatters, had grabbed his rifle that was lodged in the dirt next to the tent and frantically called out for his friend, not knowing if he was too late. It was at this point that the bear had carried Nielsen about a hundred feet from the camp, where it would drop him onto the ground, stand over him, and begin raking its claws down his torso. Nielsen could feel his ribs crack as he sunk into the ground under the bear's weight. Suddenly, the bear stopped and would turn to face a trembling Field who was standing in front of him with his finger on his rifle's trigger. As Field steadied himself, finding his aim, a bloodied Nielsen then screamed and pleaded for his friend to shoot. The determined bear would then make another move. It grabbed Nielsen by the head and stood on its hind legs, lifting him off the ground as he screamed in agony. Field, meanwhile, looked on in horror, frozen in shock as he realized that he no longer had a clear shot, as Nielsen's blood-soaked body hung in front of the bear. As Field ran toward them to get a better shot, the bear would then drop down on all fours, finally giving him a chance to take a shot, which would pierce through the bear's shoulder, causing it to drop Nielsen to the ground. Field would then fire four more shots into the bear's chest, which would finally take down the massive ursine. Field would then immediately reload his rifle before rushing over to his friend's side. A horrified Field would then discover the extent of his friend's injuries. Nielsen's scalp was hanging loose, his shoulder was torn open, and his upper body was covered in deep gashes. But remarkably, he was still alive and conscious. Field then carried him back to the tent, bandaged him as best as he could to stop the bleeding, and wrapped him in a sleeping bag. He would then go on to assure him that he would live. But despite his friend's attempt at giving him hope, Nielsen nevertheless was groaning in pain, and truly felt that this was the end for him. To their good fortune, however, the pair did have one last hope in the form of a satellite phone which Field would then promptly use to call the hospital in Longyear van, managing to keep Nielsen awake and conscious in the two hours that it took for a rescue copter to arrive. Nielsen was then flown to the hospital, where he was operated on for almost three hours. The doctors would then later tell them that one of the bear's bites to his torso had missed Nielsen's lungs by just three millimeters, and had it made contact, it would very likely have killed him. Nielsen and Field would go on to share what was their biggest regret from the incident, which was the fact that they had to kill the bear and that despite their brutal encounter, they still respect and admire these magnificent beasts of the Arctic. Of course, these days, from as far away as possible. Polar bears have been well documented to be indiscriminate predators and are among the likeliest carnivores to prey on humans, especially when their primary food source is low. Something to note about their habitat is that it's heavily impacted by climate change, resulting in a significantly lowered amount of annual ice, which the bears depend on for hunting along the Arctic coasts. This results in most of the bears ending up having to spend their summers on land, waiting for the waters to freeze again. Meaning, by around the time of late July, the polar bears are extremely hungry, which of course contributed to the likelihood of Nielsen and Fields' near-fatal encounter. In today's episode, we venture back to the year 1967 and unravel the events that changed the way we interact with bears to this day. On August 11th of that fateful year, a lightning storm surged through the park, setting the scene for the chaos that ensued. The storm was initially named a factor behind the bear's strange behavior, laying the blame at the feet of Mother Nature. But as the story unfolded, a broader picture was unveiled, one that would raise questions, revise policies, and reinforce our respect for these magnificent animals. 
Hit that like and subscribe button if you're new. You're watching When Grizzlies Attack. Known as the crown of the continent, Glacier National Park stretches over more than 1 million acres and boasts over a thousand plant species as well as hundreds of species of animals, from ground squirrels to grizzlies. The pristine park contains one of the few historically intact ecosystems in North America, but the unprecedented events of the summer of 1967 would highlight the deadly repercussions that can result from disrupting nature's delicate balance. Around 8 p.m. on August 12th of that fateful year, 19-year-old university sophomore Julie Helgeson and her boyfriend Roy Ducat laid out their sleeping bags at the Granite Park Chalet campgrounds. They both worked at the Eastern Glacier Park Lodge for the summer, Helgeson in laundry and 18-year-old Ducat as a busboy. Earlier that day, the young couple hiked the spectacular Highline train and were enjoying what started out as the perfect day. After dinner that evening, they would fall asleep under the stars. Around midnight, a terrified Helgeson woke Ducat who struggled to make out her words as she whispered through clenched teeth. Just as he realized what she was trying to say, Ducat would suddenly find himself flying through the air. Play dead, is what Julie Helgeson said to her boyfriend, before they were both flung with a single swipe of a large clawed paw into the air that was suddenly filled with a musty, sour stench. Ducat, who was on his stomach, would then lift his head and look over at Helgeson, who had landed just a few feet away from him. He barely collected his thoughts when he felt a set of teeth suddenly sink deep into his shoulder scraping against the bone. He tried as best as he could to lay still, and for a moment, the bear stopped. But to his horror, it instead turned its attention to the now screaming Helgeson, ripping away at her body. The bear then turned back to Ducat, tearing into his limbs as he lay motionless before leaving him once again for Helgeson. The last thing a helpless Ducat would hear from his girlfriend was her screams amid the crunching of her bones. And just a few moments later, as the screaming drifted away, Ducat realized that the bear was dragging her into the woods. A stumbling Ducat would then make his way to some nearby campers that he'd met earlier that day, who were camping just outside a small trail cabin near the campground. Upon arriving, he would instantly collapse at the feet of one of the campers, urging them to go find Helgeson. By now, several guests at the cabin had heard the screams and alerted park management. Meanwhile, a severely mauled Ducat was being attended by two doctors and an Air Force medic, who just so happened to be guests at the chalet that night. He was then flown to a hospital in Kalispel by a helicopter. Meanwhile, the ranger on duty led a frightened search party to look for Helgeson in the dark. Among the group were Jesuit priest Father Thomas Connolly and his friend Steve Pierre, a member of the Kalispel tribe. Steve would go on to track a blood trail from the campground, with the priest and the chalet manager Tom Walton in tow. As they followed a muffled voice, they would finally find Julie Helgeson laying motionless, face down in a ditch. Her hair matted with blood and dirt, her legs covered in long gashes and puncture wounds, her arm chewed to the bone, and foaming blood oozed from her chest. Somehow, Helgeson was still alive and conscious, which is when using a makeshift stretcher, the men promptly carried her back to the chalet, where the three doctors fought to save her life. Sadly, however, Helgeson had lost too much blood. It was at this point that Father Thomas held her hand and read her her last rites before Julie Helgeson drew her last breath. As the group sat around her in a stunned silence, solemnly taking in what they just witnessed, Little did they know that this macabre incident was not the last of the night. And less than 10 miles away, park rangers would witness an event so horrifying that it would haunt them for the rest of their lives. The second attack happened in Camas Valley. A small group of friends had been working at Lake McDonald Lodge for the summer, and like Ducat and Helgeson, were enjoying some downtime in the park. Among the five youngsters were two couples, including 19-year-old Michelle Coons and her boyfriend Ron Nosek, Ron's brother Ray and his girlfriend Denise Huckle, 16-year-old Paul Dunn, and an abandoned puppy that Denise had found in the park named Squirt. The group hiked from Lake McDonald over Howe Ridge to Trout Lake. It was a blazing hot day and there was a hint of smoke in the air from fires that erupted during the lightning storm the night before. The group set up camp at a popular campsite near Log Jam at the outlet of the lake, where they encountered two fishermen who'd warned them about a bear that had been harassing them the day before. The fishermen seemed quite rattled by the incident, but the young campers were in good spirits and weren't too worried feeling confident that they could handle a bear encounter. They would later catch a fish and then cook it along with some hot dogs over a fire. This was when Michelle spotted a bear ambling up the campsite between the trees. The group then quickly ran uphill and watched as the large mangy grizzly ate their dinner before running into the woods. The frightened group contemplated hiking through the night back to Lake McDonald, but decided instead to remake their camp on the lakeshore. They would keep the fire going and build a wall of logs, separating them from the old campsite. It wasn't until 2 a.m. that the bear returned. It investigated the campsite, ate a bag of cookies it found, 
and left again. Terrified by yet another close encounter, the group then made the fire even bigger by adding some more logs and decided that they'd stay up until sunrise. However, just a couple of hours later, they'd all drifted back to sleep. Around 4.30 a.m., Denise would suddenly wake up to the sound of splashing water. She peered out of the sleeping bag she'd been sharing with Squirt and would freeze in horror as she saw a large shape emerge from the darkness, and it was moving fast. In fact, it seemed like the shape was running towards their campsite. She drew the sleeping bag over herself and Squirt, who was squealing in fear, and clamped her hand over the trembling dog's mouth. She could hear the bear sniffing amid the sounds of canvas ripping. It was at this point that Paul woke up from his slumber, only to see a huge bear lumbering over him just feet away, its slow and deep breathing indicative of its large size. Teary-eyed and terrified, the group then muttered to each other to play dead. But again, this didn't work, and instead of losing interest, the bear bit into Paul's sleeping bag, grabbing hold of his sweatshirt. Startled, Paul then flung his sleeping bag and sprung up, slamming into the bear before sprinting to a nearby tree and scaling it in seconds thanks to a rush of adrenaline. The others meanwhile managed to escape toward the lake and climb up the trees around the old campsite while the bear was distracted. But Michelle couldn't move. She'd been paralyzed with fear, and it wasn't until the bear was just a few feet away that she tried to unzip her sleeping bag, but as fate would have it, the zipper was stuck. The bear then pounced on Michelle, grabbing the sleeping bag in its mighty jaws and proceeding to thrash it back and forth with Michelle still inside. She would then let out a piercing scream as the bear ripped into her with its claws. Paul would then watch helplessly as the grizzly pulled her from her sleeping bag and carried her into the woods. He could hear the muffled sounds of bone snapping before everything went quiet. Denise, Squirt, Paul, and the brothers remained in the trees until dawn, which is when they finally climbed down, grabbed their boots and jackets, raced down the trail toward the road, and hitched a ride to Lake McDonald Ranger Station. As they reported the nightmare they just lived through to Ranger Leonard Landa, Landa would promptly grab his rifle and head for Trout Lake with Paul and Ron. They would follow a grim trail of clues, including clothing items and a severed ear, leading them into a dark, mossy spruce forest where they finally found Michelle Coon's severely mutilated body. Her abdomen was ripped out, and the hair was missing from her head. Upon being alerted about the attack, the park rangers were instructed to shoot any bear in the vicinity of Trout Lake and Granite Park Chalet. Some bait was set up at the chalet, and two bears were killed, and another was shot near Trout Lake. This one was a mangy, emaciated sow, and on closer inspection, the rangers even found glass shards in her gums. Her stomach was then cut open, and its contents poured out with a clump of blonde hair, concluding that this was the bear that had killed Michelle Coons. But the bodies of the bears at the chalet did not show any signs of attacking humans, so the bear that attacked and killed Julie Helgeson was still at large. Again, the rangers would then set up some bait at the chalet, which would shortly after attract the sow with two cubs. The sow was shot, and it died calling out to her cubs. As if not tragic enough, one of the cubs was later shot, but escaped with an injured jaw and was eventually put down the following summer. While blood found under the sow's nails believed to belong to Helgeson, FBI tests would reveal that the blood was not human, and it was ultimately unclear whether the bear that killed Julie Helgeson was ever caught. The tragic night had claimed six innocent lives in what were the first fatal bear attacks since the park's inception, but the ordeal was not over yet. There were many unanswered questions around the behavior of the bears that night, and what ultimately led to the gruesome double fatality. For a while, the park remained silent about the incidents, eventually releasing a public statement listing a number of possible reasons for the unprecedented attacks. But the public slowly began piecing together what had happened. There had been several reports from Kelly's camp near Lake McDonald's Lodge that summer of a thin, mangy sow with long white claws who was unpredictable and unusually aggressive. She would forage the garbage cans for food, and often throw tantrums, destroying and trashing the area, and she was even spotted charging into the cabin walls. And in the week prior to the attacks, she chased a group of Girl Scouts and stole some of their food, including a small glass of jelly. The rangers knew that this was the bear that had attacked and killed Michelle Coons, and despite multiple efforts, they'd been unsuccessful up to that point to shoot or capture her as she'd proven to be extremely cunning and evasive. The sow moved on to Trout Lake by August, where the campground was later described as a battleground strewn with garbage. The campground at Granite Park Chalet was fairly new. On the 9th of August, just four days before the attacks, park rangers witnessed bears feeding in the trash outside the chalet. Disturbed by this, they filled a report with park management, which was ignored. It had later come to light that a gas-fired incinerator was installed just a few years prior, intended of disposing of the chalet garbage, but it was too small, which is why chalet staff were forced to continue dumping the trash into the gully outside. 
Despite several ranger objections, this area of the park would quickly become a hotspot for scavenging bears and ultimately a tourist attraction where guests and staff alike would gather to watch the spectacle. At this point, you might be surprised at the relaxed attitude towards the bears. But it's important to note that at the time, grizzlies, particularly those at Glacier, were not seen as dangerous animals, and the general feeling about them was complacent given the park's history. But grizzly attacks had in fact become more common, owing of course to the increased human presence in the park, as well as a decrease in habitat for bears in general. It's important that we dive into all that went wrong leading to the harrowing events of 1967. On the one hand, bears were allowed to scavenge, which led them to become food conditioned and habituated to human presence. This was of course a major red flag, as food conditioning changes the behavior of an animal, causing it to take risks and lose its fear of humans. Contrary to popular belief, most predators don't see humans as prey, and attacks are almost always out of fear, where the animal perceives the human as a threat. But when a predator starts to associate humans with food, it means that something has gone terribly wrong. On the other hand, the complacency of park management and the fact that grizzlies were not seen as dangerous animals indicated the sheer lack of knowledge and respect for wildlife, particularly formidable predators like grizzly bears. Glacier National Park was established in 1910 and saw 4,000 visitors in its first year. Around this time, grizzly bears in North America were heavily persecuted, and many sought refuge in the park's backcountry, which was still fairly isolated in a place where they could not easily be hunted. And for a while, the bears were even able to thrive in peace here, away from people. But what changed? In 1932, the Going to the Sun Road was constructed and was one of the most impressive engineering feats of the time. Seven years later, the first bear attack was recorded, when a hiker encountered three bears and was mauled. An eventual increase in visitors to the backcountry would see a rise in clashes, which is when the park would finally start taking measures for bear management. Incidents like these don't happen out of the blue. They're in fact ticking time bombs, culminating over time following a series of human mistakes often born in a dark history. What happened at Glacier National Park on the fateful night of the Grizzlies was neither the fault of the victims nor the bears. Perhaps the only saving grace in this story was that a great deal was learned from the events of August 67. Many changes were made and strict rules were implemented and enforced nationwide for the protection of both people and bears. In the vast, untouched wilderness of Alaska's Katmai National Park, one man dared to cross the invisible line separating man from beast. And he did this not merely to coexist, but to practically become one of them. His name was Timothy Treadwell, a self-styled eco-warrior, bear enthusiast, and a man who danced on the precipice of life and death for 13 perilous summers. To some, he was a hero. To others, a fool tempting fate with an unshakable belief in the benignity of one of nature's most powerful predators, grizzly bears. In 1957, Treadwell had a seemingly ordinary upbringing in Long Island, New York. His young adulthood, however, was plagued with a variety of struggles. After moving to California in hopes of launching an acting career, Treadwell found himself battling repeated rejections this period was difficult for him, marked by a spiraling descent into substance abuse. It was alcohol in particular that had a destructive hold over him. His life seemed to be careening off track, and he found himself in dire straits, including a near-fatal heroin overdose. Following a close call with the overdose, Treadwell would go on to have what can only be described as an epiphany, and what once was a lost man seeking purpose would go on to find it in the most improbable of places. In the early 1990s, a now clean and sober Treadwell, drawn like a moth to an irresistible flame of adventure, embarked on a journey that would forever change his life. He was drawn to the Alaskan wilderness, specifically Katmai National Park, a remote reserve known for its sizable population of grizzly bears. It was here that he would encounter his first grizzly bear, a sighting that would go on to profoundly impact him. As someone who had been searching for a sense of purpose and belonging, Treadwell found a deep connection with these majestic creatures, and their raw power and primal nature would go on to resonate with him in ways only he could understand. In fact, he would go on to become fascinated and even obsessed with his newfound love. His early experiences in Katmai were a far cry from his later, more intimate interactions with the bears. At first, he maintained a cautious distance, observing and learning about them as much as he possibly could. He was also largely self-taught, relying on his observations and experiences, rather than any sort of formal training or expert advice. 
This would go on, of course, to become a significant proponent to his eventual fate. Over time, he started getting closer and closer to the bears, pushing the boundaries of safety day by day. With his unconventional methods and approaches, which were by many deemed reckless by normal standards, for Treadwell was a natural progression of his relationship with the bears. His interactions with grizzly bears would go on to become a dance on the edge of the abyss, a flirtation with danger that defied conventional wisdom and safety protocols. In fact, he'd often get within mere feet of the grizzlies, sometimes even touching them, violating practically every safety guideline established by wildlife experts. Grizzlies are known for their unpredictability, as well as their territorial nature, and experts widely agree that these creatures are typically to be observed from a distance of at least 100 yards. But Treadwell would commonly shrug off such caution, viewing it as a barrier to his understanding and connection with the creatures whom he considered family. In fact, he considered them family so much so that he even interacted directly with bear cubs, a behavior regarded as incredibly risky since grizzly sows are famously protective of their young and undoubtedly have a high probability of becoming aggressive if they perceive a threat. And Treadwell's engagement with these cubs, while seen as endearing by some, was for this very reason a highly dangerous game that put him squarely in the path of potential maternal wrath. Over time, Treadwell would go on to no longer just observe these bears, but further immerse himself in their world every chance that he got. He went on to name many of them, and talk to them as if they were human, and even attributed human emotions and motivations to them, a practice known as anthropomorphizing. And while this created a sense of familiarity and connection for Treadwell, it went on to cloud his judgment, hindering his understanding of the true, wild nature of these animals. His camping practices were also questionable. Instead of setting up camp in areas less frequented by bears and maintaining a clean camp to deter them, Treadwell often camped in close proximity to bear trails and feeding sites which of course significantly increased his chances of dangerous encounters. It was during these early trips that he began his tradition of spending every summer in Katmai, documenting his experiences and interactions with the bears on a video camera that he'd religiously bring along with him, a routine he would continue for 13 years. During this period, however, Treadwell's life was not entirely without human contact. In fact, he kept in touch with the outside world, using his experiences and self-recorded footage to educate the public about grizzlies. His charisma, coupled with his passionate advocacy, would go on to earn him a cult following, and he went on to appear on numerous talk shows as well as give presentations at a number of schools. Yet it was apparent to everyone around him that his heart truly belonged to none other than the Grizzlies. He would even find a kindred spirit in his girlfriend Amy Huguenard, who would join him in his risky escapades. For 12 summers, Treadwell's daring exploits, captured in over 100 hours of footage, would become a testament to his unique, a foolhardy relationship with the Grizzlies. It wasn't until the 13th summer that Treadwell's luck would finally run out. It was a fateful day on October 5th that marked the departure from Treadwell's usual routine. Typically, he would have left Katmai by late September, when most of the bears he was familiar with would start going into hibernation. However, in 2003, for reasons that to this day remain speculative, Treadwell decided to stay longer. Some theories suggest he was trying to protect the bears from poachers, whereas others proposed that he wanted to observe the less familiar, more aggressive bears that descended from the mountains in search of food before winter. But regardless, whatever the reason, Treadwell and his girlfriend, Amy Huguenard, set up camp in the Grizzly Maze on that fateful October day. The Grizzly Maze is a dense labyrinthine area of Katmai, known for its high concentration of grizzly bears, which makes it no wonder why camping in this area is considered highly dangerous the dense vegetation in the maze makes it difficult to spot bears until they're very close, and this of course increases the chance of a potential encounter, as well as reduces the reaction time if one were to occur. Especially in the fall when food becomes scarcer, the bears in the maze can become more aggressive as they try consuming enough calories to sustain hibernation through winter, and during this time they may be more likely to view humans as a potential food source. The chilling events of October 5th, 2003 unfolded with the disconcerting gut-wrenching clarity in the audio recording left behind by Treadwell and Huguenard. The tape begins abruptly, jolted to life mid-attack. The first voice we hear is Amy's, her tone laced with surprise and fear as she asks, is it still out there? Whether Timothy asked her to switch on the camera or if she did so instinctively remains uncertain. Timothy's voice cuts through next, a desperate cry piercing the stormy night. Get out here, I'm getting killed out here. The remote microphone on his coveralls, capturing every agonizing moment. 
The sound of a tent zipper then follows, the flap opening to the horrifying scene unfolding outside. Amy's voice rings over the cacophony of rain, wind, and the guttural sounds of the Baron Timothy locked in a deadly confrontation. She screams advice ingrained in every wilderness survival guide. She's heard shouting, play dead, followed by a pause, then the command echoes again, a desperate plea for help, hanging in the frigid Alaskan air. Shockingly, the bear would at this point break off its attack, perhaps distracted by Amy's frenzied screams. A hushed conversation would then ensue between the couple as they try to ascertain if the bear had truly retreated. Trained as a physician's assistant, Amy presumably tried to move towards Timothy, only to then be forced to retreat as the sound of the bear's return reverberates through the tape. Playing dead had failed, and Timothy's voice rises again in terror, imploring Amy to yell, hit the bear. The ensuing sounds are muffled by the storm, the rain, and wind, obscuring the horrifying symphony of the attack. Amy's voice is then heard breaking through the static, urging Timothy to fight back, screaming at the bear to stop, go away, or possibly run away, are interspersed with a discordant clang of a frying pan that was striking the bear's head as well as Timothy's agonized moans. As the attack progresses, it's believed the bear released its grip from Timothy's head, shifting to latch on to his upper leg area. Amidst the chaos, Timothy's voice rings out again, this time not in a plea for help, but a selfless command to his girlfriend. Amy, get away. Just get away. Amy, go away. And it's assumed by many that it was at this tragic moment he understood that his life was slipping away and so sought to save Amy from sharing his grim fate. But Amy did not go away. The chilling audio recording would span for approximately six minutes, and throughout about two-thirds of this time, Timothy's desperate pleas and cries for help can be heard, and unlike those fortunate enough to slip into an adrenaline-induced dream state in their final moments, Timothy was tragically, painfully aware. Contrary to the roaring, snarling bears often depicted in films, the grizzly in this audio was eerily quiet. The low growls and occasional grunts, barely audible amidst the storm and screams, amplified the dread permeating the scene. The haunting sounds of the bear dragging Timothy away, his screams fading into the distance, would signal a gruesome end to the confrontation, at least at the campsite. As Timothy was pulled further into the wilderness, the tape captured a new crescendo of terror. Amy's high-pitched screams, her cries echoing through the woods, bore an uncanny resemblance to a predator call used by hunters, imitating the distressed cries of a small wounded animal, sounds which to her misfortune are known to attract bears. Larry Van Daly, a biologist for Alaska Department of Fish and Game, theorized that these very screams may have been what drew the bear back to the campsite, leading to Amy's tragic demise. The horror of what Amy experienced in those moments is unimaginable. Paralyzed with fear, she was reportedly standing just outside the tent, frozen from having witnessed the attack on Timothy. When the grizzly returned and turned its attention to her, the agony of those final moments and the sheer terror she must have felt is just a mere yet undoubtedly chilling footnote to what would go down as one of the most tragic tales in recorded history. Tim and Amy's partially consumed remains would be later discovered by a pilot who had come to pick them up and the grizzly responsible was later found not far from the campsite and killed by park rangers. Treadwell's tragic end sent shockwaves through the public, and in the wildlife conservation community, it would spark intense debates about the ethics and safety of human-animal interactions. Some saw his death as a tragic but inevitable outcome of his boundary-pushing approach, while others mourned the loss of a passionate advocate for wildlife. Treadwell's life and death would inspire the documentary Grizzly Man by Werner Herzog, in death, as in life, Treadwell to this day remains for many a figure of fascination, an enigma who dared to live among the grizzlies, a man who loved bears more than he feared them. In the break of an early fall morning in 2016, 50-year-old trail engineer and knife maker Todd Orr ventured into Montana's breathtaking Madison Valley in hopes of scouting elk. This particular region of the country is known for its beautiful landscapes, pristine rivers, and abundant wildlife. Nestled between the Madison Range to the east and the Gravelli Range to the west, the valley is located in the southwestern part of Montana, extending from West Yellowstone to Ennis and beyond. The region is defined by the Madison River, 
which flows through it, offering excellent opportunities for fishing, particularly trout. The valley is furthermore home to an impressive variety of wildlife, making it an attractive destination for nature enthusiasts as well as outdoor adventurers. Among the large mammals inhabiting the region are elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, moose, bighorn sheep, as well as mountain goats. Additionally, several carnivorous species can also be found in the area. This includes gray wolves, black bears, as well as, of course, grizzly bears. Approximately three miles into his hike, Todd would suddenly stumble upon a sow grizzly and her two cubs. The mother bear spotted Todd and hastily retreated with her cubs over a ridge. Todd then cautiously waits for a moment before continuing eastward away from the bears. As he moved forward, a noise caught his attention. The very same sow grizzly was charging him from about 40 yards, coming fast and low to the ground, and ears laid back. Despite her enormous size, Todd would note that her speed was astonishing. Instinctively, Todd then grabs the bear spray from his chest holster and would then begin shouting, hoping this would scare the bear and cause it to retreat. Despite his efforts, the bear would unfortunately show no signs of stopping. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Todd would then discharge the bear spray at the charging animal. The bear's momentum then carried her through the orange cloud of pepper mist as she barreled into Todd. It's at this point that Todd turns away, dropping to the ground and locks his arms around his head and neck in an attempt to shield them. The grizzly then proceeded to viciously bite his arms, shoulders and back, the sound of crushing and tearing muscles filling his ears. Just as suddenly as she had appeared, the bear then disappeared, likely a result of the bear spray's effect. At this point, he quickly assesses his injuries, which were severe, but not immediately life-threatening. Convinced that the bear was gone, he then starts back towards the trailhead, which was three miles away. Despite the blood seeping through his clothing, he maintained a steady pace, hoping to put as much distance between himself and the bear as possible. Just as Todd began to feel safe, the unthinkable would happen. Like something out of a horror movie, the protective grizzly sow would then reappear, charging him for a second time. Barely having any time to react before the bear was once more upon him, Todd would then resume his protective stance and bore the brunt of the bear's furious attack as it bit his arms and shoulders with even more aggression than before. As he felt the grizzly's teeth sinking deep into his flesh with each bite, he screamed in agony at the intense pain as he heard the crunch of bone breaking in his left forearm. It was at this point that for a brief moment, the bear would suddenly seize its onslaught, standing on top of Todd in complete silence. The weight of the enormous creature was crushing, and a helpless and horrified Todd could hear and feel the bear's breath on his neck. Fearful that any moment would provoke another attack, he would at this point lay as still as possible. And after a few incredibly long-seeming moments, the bear would then finally once again depart. Todd then cautiously surveyed his surroundings, at which point he realized that his pistol had been ripped from his body during the attack. To his relief, he would find the weapon nearby after a brief search, and would then much more confidently, with his pistol and bear spray at the ready, journey his way down the trail. A few moments later, Todd would assess his wounds and manage the bleeding as best as he could. His injuries were undoubtedly severe, but he had full faith that he could make it to his truck and drive himself to the hospital. He would then just a few more moments into the hike encounter a rancher whom he asked to call the hospital to alert them of his impending arrival. Upon reaching the trailhead, Todd would then attempt to leave a warning note for other hunters, but his injured arm would make it impossible to write legibly. Realizing that he had survived a near-death experience, Todd then decides to document the moment by taking photos and a video of his injuries one that would go viral. As a side note, due to the restrictive nature of this platform, I'm not able to post that video here as it does show a bit of gore and some blood that his scalp was hanging off his forehead. So I'm not able to show that on this platform. I will, however, about 24 hours after the posting of this video, upload that video to Rumble for you. And once again, to access this channel's Rumble, all you gotta do is Google when animals attack, that's with no spaces, and then Rumble right after it and you should find it on one of the top links. Todd would then cover the truck seat with jackets to soak up the blood and would rush to the hospital. 
Upon arriving, Todd was met by a doctor, nurse, and local sheriff's officer. His injuries, including a broken ulna bone, deep puncture wounds on his arm and shoulder, and a five-inch gash on the side of his head, would take the medical team six hours to stitch closed. Todd's left forearm would require surgery to repair the severed tendons and shredded muscle. Numerous nerves had also been damaged, and he anticipated many months of physical therapy to regain the use of his arm and hand. The harrowing experience would leave him with lasting physical reminders, including a deep scar on the side of his head. In the end, Todd Orr survived a situation that would, to most ears, sound like a surefire death sentence. A double grisly attack. His determination, presence of mind, and sheer willpower saw him through his incredible ordeal, and his story serves as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. This enthralling story encourages us not to just approach our adventures in the wilderness with caution and humility, but also to seek a deeper understanding of the captivating dynamics that govern the complex ecosystems we so often take for granted. If this episode piqued your interest, then our previous episode featuring Shark Week 2023's most brutal shark attacks is likely to do the same. You can find it on the end screen of this video.